in this podcast we'll be talking to ceo of tiger beetle db i wanted to interview him because i wanted to learn why will you choose a language like zig which is a new language and i really love that language to develop a distributed database from scratch and when i say from scratch i literally mean it the design des- decisions which yoran has taken has fascinated me and that is why i wanted to talk to him one on one and learn a lot of things about tiger beetle db and its implementation and what makes tiger beetle db different from the existing solutions out there in this podcast you will be also getting a chance to pick your own's brain on what are the new things in systems programming and distributed systems which makes him excited about this field he also gives a lot of ideas to new startup founders who want to do something in this space so make sure that you watch this video till the end and give this video a like and share this video with your friends as well all right so we are live um thanks a lot yoren for accepting the invite of a new podcast person here and uh, i have been following the work of tiger tiger beetle since i started looking into zig it has been fa- absolutely fascinating the way you are also developing uh, zig zig ecosystem along with how you are openly and building tiger beetle as an open source project that has been awesome so i have got some questions for you yoren and that's why i asked um uh, some time from you so i hope that you are also excited to answer those questions for me i'm super excited for paul thanks so much for for having me and it's a real honor to help you kick off a new podcast uh, to be there in the beginning so i'm i'm looking forward to the questions and and our discussion thanks a lot so i'll start with the very fundamental question which i also have because uh i followed tiger beetle there are a lot of new databases coming around i am not sure what is happening in the database ecosystem everybody is developing a new database and uh, i really want to understand what type of database tiger beetle is and in which category you will see tiger beetle fit in and adding to that can you also tell me the ecosystem around tiger beetle who are your competitors and is there any specific gap in the market which you are filling sure so we we definitely didn't set out to create a new database or a new category of database what happened was i was consulting on a payment switch trying to find the performance bottlenecks and we saw that what what this payment switch was was mysql with 10000 lines of code and they didn't realize they were building a ledger database and we saw this and we thought this is actually a database uh, it's so much application code around a general purpose database at the core but this would be better served if we can give people a first class ledger database and then we looked around and everybody seemed to have this problem and um so i think it's a new category of database uh, you get s you know there was a time when we used to put our user images in postgres and now they're in s3 object storage um the time where we used to use the database as a queue and now we use kafka or better yet red panda one of my favorite new databases uh and analytics is another example uh so it's a, it's a new category a ledger database and what it is is really it's solving the problem how do you and i think this is surprising um because if you if you read the documentation for any oltp database they will say that you know we give consistency so that alice can pay bob and you can be sure that the you know the <clears throat> money won't be counted twice but when you look at these general purpose databases they don't actually give you double entry accounting primitives which is what you really want if you want to be tracking payments you know for Alice to pay Bob you actually just want double entry because that's how it's always been done it's the it's the um centuries old schema you know they i think that it, i would never try to take on sql but I would never try to take on double entry either and it it looked like a lot of people were trying to take on double entry by doing something on SQL uh better if you have first class double entry primitives that that um you know we always make the mistake of reinventing accounting and we looked around and and thought well let's let's give developers um you know for example a OLTP database will give you logical it'll give you physical data consistency raw consistency of your of your columns and your rows 
But I think what developers really want when they're tracking financial transactions is they want logical financial consistency. So money cannot be created nor destroyed. It must maybe move from one account to the other. So that, that you know, your primitives, the convenience, um, logical financial consistency rather than physical row consistency. If you only have row consistency, it's it's not always enough because often you, you know you're touching two rows. So if you can give developers strong um, financial accounting primitives, it's much easier to to build things on top of. Um, and it and you can you can optimize things. So what the other problem we saw was um, uh, a lot of companies had a problem of scale, uh, and the general purpose databases were hitting the wall. A thousand transactions a second, maybe ten thousand if they did everything right. But the the double entry domain, the workload, it has this inherent problem of contention. You're always debiting one account and crediting another account, and one of those accounts is going to be an extremely hot account, like a bank account. So that is going to take the row lock, and that is going to serialize everything. So it makes things like horizontal sharding. You can't really do that because all your shards are going to be bottlenecked by this one bank account. Um, group commit also couldn't really optimize this. Um, so we, we could basically take the problem and see this is a ledger database, and then we could solve for financial consistency and also scale instead of you know hitting the wall at 1,000 or 10,000 transactions a second. We can design for hundreds of thousands of transactions a second because the database is meant for tracking financial transactions at scale. And I think finally, the other thing we saw is that if you look at open source databases, Postgres or MySQL, they don't really come out of the box with high availability. That's like an add-on. And we wanted to say to developers, look, um, you want high availability for your financial transactions ledger because your whole business is running on it. You know, if, if your ledger goes down, your business goes down. So you want a cluster uh, a, a single binary that you just spin up on machines and this thing is never going to go down. Uh, so we wanted high availability baked into the database. So um, I have a very basic question here. So let's say I am a data engineer and I work for a uh, for a bank and I want to propose to the bank that uh, this is your bottleneck of transactions. Let's say you want to um, increase the amount of transactions. And I have heard about Tiger Beetle, that it is something, I don't know what it, this is exactly, but if I bring it in, I will I hope that my whole stack is more performant. So to that person who is taking that decision, um, it can be a data lead or you know data architect or that kind of a person who is pitching Tiger Beetle to its company. What would you tell him the key thing to take a note of how do you how does he con uh, convincingly decide that he should go with tiger beetle okay so i think it depends on the the size of the startup or the company if it's a fintech startup uh they want tiger beetle because they just want to get to market quicker they want you know you you don't want to if you're if you're a startup you don't want to build your own ledger database you don't have time for that and it's too risky you know it's very tricky to get the accounting primitives right and high availability, it's a big problem. So you just want an, a great open source database and there is your ledger and you're done and you can start building. Um, that's how I would pitch it. Uh, that is how I pitch it. Uh, if, if it was a bigger company, you know, like a, like a unicorn, like an Uber or an Airbnb, there the problem is scale. And I think they, they all know this because they've run into the problem um, where and, and they end up investing and building their own ledger database. Uh, so those ones, uh, that they, they're again, Tiger Beetle is great. And it's, it's because we have designed the whole database for this narrow domain, this, this narrow problem, we've really gone deep on the technology. So, um, and it's open source again, which I think is important for, for large companies. They know, you know, they, they can run it themselves, um, but they want open source. So, so again, for them, it's just the scale. You know, um, are, are we going to adopt a solution that is not open source, that is going to lock us into a, a cloud provider that isn't going to give us logical financial consistency? We're still going to have to do a lot of work on top. Um, 
or are we going to adopt a solution that is really going to give us, you know, a hundred x, thousand x scale, but also cost efficiency? It's because if you have this kind of performance, hundreds of thousands of transactions a second, you might not need that even as a very large company. Um, but you can trade that for cost efficiency. You you'll have cheaper, you know, hardware that you require to run to run your ledger database. So that's that's what I would say there. Cool. So one thing which uh, I am also observing that there are some databases which are not transactional database, like uh, for example, ClickHouse. So ClickHouse has also got its own uh, cloud offering. Let's just you plug it into ClickHouse database and you are up and running. So as the how do you see Tiger Beetle's future? Do you also plan to have that kind of a hosted solution where you take care of everything, or do you want to be like? um you know the traditional open source tool that this is what it is and we are this is what i we have made the best and you take care of deployment and everything yes i think it's natural you know if, if you if you are an open source database to help um your users as much as possible to deploy it so if they can deploy it themselves it's great if you can help them deploy it and manage it it's also great a lot a lot of startups are moving to serverless as well you know to have a push button experience because again, you know, um, startups just want to get to market. They, they want, you know, if, if they want Tiger Beetle, they want it now. You know, push the button, mm. have it up and running. So, as far as we can help with that, uh, we will. You know, and that, that's also pretty exciting. That's 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 really interesting. How Tiger Beetle is. Um, I mean, it uh, so it's like more exciting for me because I am too young in this ecosystem, and I am seeing a database being developed from scratch in front of my eyes. So it is yeah. uh, quite exciting to me. Uh, one uh, thing thanks. I read about. Sorry, thanks, please. people. Just, just just to say, I feel the same way. By the way, you know, I pinch myself, but what you know, being being here and watching this whole thing also happening, I wonder, like, you know, how did we do this? How did we get here? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. So um, I had done some investigation in the documentation of Tiger Beetle. And uh, what I uh, found out was that Tiger Beetle DB claims to provide strict serializability. Now, uh, I have read a lot about this, but I explained it to me in a way that I have got no idea what this line means and why it is important for me. Okay. So here goes, right? This is... This is strict serializability explained loosely. So this is not the Martin Kleppmann or Heidi Howard or Carl Kingsbury definition. This is the the bono of you two. Like let's you know give the very simple big idea. Um, so strict serializability, I would say, is consistency in time and space. So time is linearizability, um, and linearizability is. If I, if I send a financial transaction in and later I send another financial transaction in, um, the second one, the second transaction should see the first. Um, and it should also see others that other people have done. So if, if I'm allowed to have a back channel to other people who's sending transactions in, none of us should ever be able to see that the database messed with time. So it's not allowed to mess with time. Time must be consistent. And then the second aspect is space. So consistency in time and space. And the space component, I think, is serializability. So serializability, um, the word has to do with database transactions and a, a transaction where you can touch all the rows in the database, in all the tables, and you can do things and move things around and you have consistency as if you... I don't know what the superhero is, but as if you get to see the whole universe and freeze everything, and then you can walk around at your leisure and go and change things, and then you can unfreeze everything. So that's consistency in time and space. Linearizability, strict, uh, serializability, add those together and you get strict serializability. Okay, so the second part of the question, why, uh, why are you offering it? Why do you think it is important to have? So I think again, it, it should. It, yeah, it comes back to the domain um, um, online transactions processing. So you know, I said we're a new category, but actually we're not. It's just an old, it's the oldest database category ever. You know, how how do you process financial transactions, and um, and you you need strict serializability because uh, it, it's funny. People say to me, yeah, but sure, we can just shard. 
But again, you can't shard because double entry, one of the accounts is always going to be like your bank account, which you can't further split because if you were to split it, you would be double counting money. And um, it's kind of the domain where you really want the highest level of consistency. Um, you do also want to have consistency across space because you want to be able to to do things across your books. Otherwise, you're limited in what your business can do, the products you can offer. You, you want to have control of your of all your finances and and see you know see everything, but also do transactions. For for instance, in the payment space, they've got a very cool feature called payment versus payment, and that says you know, you get these interesting financial contracts and they say, people say, well, I'm going to pay so-and-so, but only if so-and-so pays so-and-so and so-and-so pays so-and-so. And you set up all these things and they all happen or don't happen. But this touches the whole data set. Um, so that's where, again, you want consistency in time and space, linearizability, serializability for strict serializability. And that's just, it's the highest consistency level possible. There's nothing more, I think, um, I don't know if we have another dimension. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So um, one thing which uh, is intriguing me here is uh, Tiger, D, uh, Tiger Middle DB is distributed and we are offering uh, strict serializability. So does it mean that it is, I mean, can I assume that Tiger Middle will also work in a geo-replicated fashion if I have multiple replicas across the globe, if I'm a really big startup? Yes, that, that, that is the whole idea. So, and I think this is the surprising thing. I, I always thought consensus was all about consistency and actually using a consensus protocol to replicate your data across machines to have a distributed database where your data is distributed across machines and you use a consensus protocol like Vstamp replication, Raft or Paxos to give you strict serializability in a distributed setting. I actually thought that was all about consistency. But the truth is that the researchers who invented these protocols, for them, strict serializability was table stakes. They were like, of course, if you're doing financial transactions, you're, you're not going to sacrifice um, your bank account. You know, uh, What they were really going for was high availability. So if you have a cluster of five machines, actually what Amazon do for Aurora, as far as I understand, they have a cluster of six machines. They put two machines in 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 an AZ availability zone. So they've got three availability zones, two machines in each. They can lose a whole availability zone. They've still got four or six machines and the cluster is still operating. Then they use like Heidi Howard's flexible Paxos quorums, which gets even more complicated. Uh, and, and basically the end result is they can lose another machine. And if it's if, if the three machines running still include the primary, they're still good. And it's only if they need to elect a new primary that they need four of six. So there's always some, the intersection property holds. No, normally we think of consensus as always an odd size cluster, but things have actually changed. So even size clusters can be more efficient if you use advances. But basically the long and the short of it is this gives you very nice geo, um, <clears throat> geographic you know, fault tolerance. So three availability zones, you can lose a whole you know, geographical site and your database still runs. So this was important for Tiger Beetle because again, you know, we looked around open source databases, you don't really get this, but this is this is it locked up away, you know, in, um, in the cloud providers, you know, in their proprietary code. They haven't released this to the open source world. And we thought, well, it should be, you know, um, the ledger database, you should be able to run it as well as anything you know, the cloud providers do, you, you want mission critical um, safety, but also high availability. So that is the surprise for me that actually that's the whole point of consensus to give you this high availability, even if you lose your data center. And, and it's just, it just works, you know, 2 a.m., everything. Um, the, the current, you know, what people do is they take, they take a general purpose database and they slap on like some mix of async replication and you lose the primary database, and then you've lost data. And then you go back to the, the backup, and that that is not acceptable. So this kind of setup um, with with a proper consensus protocol, strict serializability, high availability, you actually don't lose data, um, pr provided you don't lose more than the quorum of machines. So uh, talking about availability, I had uh, attended the QCon 
uh, premiere which was happening on youtube and there i yes. saw that you have a different take on uh, availability i also went ahead and read the paper of the gray failures which is there in the documentation of uh, tiger beetle in the footnotes i, I believe so um, on github so i want Uh, you to explain me very quickly like not in the qcon details obviously because i'll link <laughs> that here in the sure the, uh, sure uh, description so i want to understand that i have always considered network or that's what i have read uh, that network partitions distributed systems network partition is what everybody focuses on but you seem to have a little bit different take on that and i want you to explain it rather than me spoiling it for you okay ah uh, thanks people so if you if you look at paxos or you look at raft it's it's the same assumption right that um you have a network fault model and the disk is perfect so stay these protocols the formal proofs they rely on stable storage and they say that stable storage is perfect it never fails um Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I always thought that's interesting because you know when I worked with MySQL, I saw a MySQL database go corrupt on me, and that was the last time I used MySQL. You know, and the, the, if you look at the, there's some papers that that you can read. One of them is analysis of latent sector errors. Another one is analysis of corruption. It's both of them are by Bara Vasundaram, um, and it was at UW Madison, University of Wisconsin Madison. and the, sort of the the numbers of corruption are on the order of about 1% per disk per tier period but if you think that you're running a cluster of five disks 1% per disk over two years is 5% over two years so that that is material um and um but again you know like think we we all know about fsync gate which affected my sequel basically every oltp database uh mongodb postgres um and others and and fsync gate was noticed and the cause of fsync gate was you know disks are not perfect um and and users noticed that they noticed that postgres lost data because it it assumed that disks were perfect and databases have a a crash consistency model so they use checksums yes they do have checksums but as far as i understand they use these checksums to recover from power loss you know after they've crashed they see a checksum mismatch and they can truncate the the log and and they think of checksums like that but they don't really think that you know some way in the middle of the data files things could get corrupted and what do you do then and then again you know zfs has has pioneered this and said well yes actually these kinds of storage faults do happen and we need um our you know our storage systems to to handle them uh, but coming back to you know those formal proofs for paxos and raft i always loved that they had a network fault model but disks were perfect but if you're implementing consensus well what is the paper that you read to know how to implement consensus where the authors of those protocols also assume that disks were perfect you know and the the formal proofs are actually broken they they break you know um you can have global cluster data loss with raft or paxos if you have a single disk sector fault in the log on one machine that can propagate it's very counterintuitive um but the paper that discovered this in the paper that shows you how to do these things correctly also came from university of wisconsin madison and it's called protocol aware recovery for consensus based storage ram alagapan ashwarya ganesan and they basically show that the current distributed systems that we use um that are built on these consensus protocols are not correct and they're also not efficient they don't give you the high availability that you're paying for so you're paying for replication five ways or three ways but if you wanted to be safe you actually have to pay triple again if you know if you're using something like ebs or zfs underneath that they whereas they could solve this for you directly and they really should and then your cluster could also be more available because it can self heal and use the consensus to repair errors on local machines uh, but durability was really important for tiger beetle again because you know 5% in a two year period is um is material but i think even just two or three weeks ago um you know xfs the file system had a bug in it 
um, where it could just write data to the wrong place on disk. And current databases are not really designed for that. But this was something in Tiger Beetle that I think is special, where we actually designed Tiger Beetle to say disks are going to not be perfect. Um, they're not going to be Byzantine, i.e. they're not going to be malicious, but they're going to be near Byzantine. So disks are going to sometimes write to the wrong place on disk. Sometimes they're going to corrupt. Uh, sometimes they're going to read from the wrong place on disk. Uh, or sometimes they're just going to go slow. And that happens too. I've seen that, you know, where disks suddenly, because of internal GC, writes take two seconds. Or, you know, someone is doing a big rsync job, uh, job on the log and now, you know, reads from the disk got two seconds. So again, you want your distributed database to work around all these faults. And, and Tiger Beetle does, you know, that, that is how we test it. And now I guess we can go into that in, in more detail as well. Yeah, sure. So I had, uh, I, I think as far as I remember, you uh, are using another wall log to kind of uh, support the primary wall log and recover from the errors which uh, which happen on the disk. So I'm, uh, am, am I correct in saying that? Can you elaborate that, a little more on that? That's right. So we have one logical write ahead log. And our, you know, as any database does, it has a write ahead log. We have one logical write ahead log. And that is actually made up internally of two physical write ahead logs. One of them is the write ahead log we've all had. You know, it's the transactions data that you have pinned to the log. The second one is new. And that one has a small little identifier for each transaction. So we have two, we have a, the big normal write ahead log. And we have a little small one with metadata identifiers. And then at startup, we read both write ahead logs. And we can use that to work out what is the correct logical write ahead log and also to repair. And we can use that to, it's, it's all integrated. This is within the local storage engine. And then we can use the global consensus protocol as well to go and repair that and fix that all up. So it's like, it's, it's like ZFS, but distributed with, you know, it doesn't have local redundancy. It's got, because obviously, you know, it could just use the whole machine. So we, we have remote redundancy through the consensus protocol. And, and all of that, yeah, you can read, read all the details in, in that paper, protocol aware recovery. That's exactly what we implement. So uh, this sounds really fascinating. I'm definitely going to dig more into this. So for this work, would you like to give a shout out to somebody from your team? Because it seems quite complicated to accomplish, right? Yes, yeah. So, so DJ on my team was the one who did the general recovery at startup, and uh, we we worked together. I was I was the review buddy, and we spent hours and hours on calls. Um, we we had the paper to go on, but we also had to do like work a lot of stuff out for the first time. So, if if you jump into the Tiger Beetle source code, um, and you go to journal.zig, then you will see. There's a beautiful table that DJ did, a whole matrix of all possible faults, what can go wrong. And at startup now, we're you know, getting our understanding of what is the right ahead log from these two physical logs that could be corrupt. And you can, you can see it all there. And basically, this matrix, we encoded it in the code, and then we generate the, the different code handlers from that and test it to make sure we've covered everything. Otherwise, it's too complex to, to try and solve. You know? Um, so yeah, shout out to DJ. Cool. So uh, I have another question here, but before I go into that, do you have any other, uh, because I found this to be a unique feature uh, from my understanding of Tiger Beetle, how Tiger Beetle is fundamentally uh, be, trying to be different from the existing database. So do you want to uh, shed light on some other things which I am not asking or I have missed, which you think is quite, uh, which makes Tiger Beetle quite unique? Yes, I think um, if you look at, again, like consensus protocols like Paxos or Raft, um, or, or let's say multi-Paxos, you know, which is the, multi-Paxos is the Paxos equivalent of Raft with one or two little details on the side. Uh, but if you look at both of those, they, they're not always, well, let, let's focus on Raft. Um, Raft, when, when it elects a new primary, it expects that the primary has a perfect log, which is kind of like the RAID 5 problem. You know, if you've ever deployed RAID and you realize that one disk has failed and you switch over to another one, by the time you switch over, then that one has also failed. 
Um, what, what we do very differently in our consensus protocol is we allow, if we have three machines and these are three logs, um, we allow failures in all the logs simultaneously. Um, every single log on every single machine can have corruption some way. Because the RAID 5 problem, you know, we, I'm, I'm old enough to remember it, um, that you can have errors in different you know, um, chunks or different you know, sections of the stripe. Um, all disks could have errors. So we, we actually uh, modified the consensus protocol view stamp replication that we use so that we can handle this. And that's, that's something pretty new. I think I don't know of any other consensus that has done it. I'm, uh, obviously, you, you can never say it's the first because in distributed systems, you, how, how would we know? <laughs> but uh, that, that, that's something that, that is you know, special in Tiger Beetle. Just the idea that every single machine can be corrupted you know, in different places and you watch Tiger Beetle running and it just keeps going. Uh, it prepares itself. And yeah, that, it feels like magic you know, for, for us as we work on it. True. Uh, so one thing I would just like to highlight for the listeners, and I hope that I am correct in saying that, uh, Tiger Beetles assumes the components to be non-malicious, but they, do, they, they don't expect it to be perfectly okay all the time as well. So if something goes bad, it doesn't mean it is its intent is to go bad. It's So it's not similar to what blockchains or uh, Bitcoin does. So that's Thanks. what a key differentiation is. That thanks, people. Exactly, you, you've nailed it. So, so we're not we're not trying to do um, decentralized consensus. Um, you, you know, or Byzantine fault tolerance. Um, we, we're trying to do non-Byzantine fault tolerance, but we assume that disks fail. So the and the disk isn't going to fail maliciously, just like the network is not going to fail maliciously. Otherwise, strict serializability would be impossible the cluster would be unavailable you know if, if an adversary can always mess with your network uh, it's the same thing but basically you know whatever the network can do the disk can do too for example like we you know jepson will say you can have network partitions that you cut off from one of the machines and disks do the same thing you know disks are like a little microcosm of distributed systems because if you look at the disk you could have one sector that is temporarily unavailable because the disk can't read from it. So it'll give you an IO error and that is called a latent sector error. So for five seconds, you can't read from that sector, you're partitioned from it. And we do things in Tiger Beetle in our superblock.zig. We do some special stuff there as well because you actually have to think of a single disk as distributed because some sectors are you know, not always available to you and then, it, then it's really fascinating. So it totals all the way down. Fascinating. So uh, I have another thing which I want to ask, which is quite interesting to me, that how do you guys do the development? So for example, since uh, you are not, let's say I am re-implementing something in Zing, which is written in Python. So design discussions don't happen that often. Here I'm assuming that design discussions are like uh, sort of everyday thing because of the complexities and the problems you are solving. And addition to that, how are you as a CEO, an execution person involved so much uh, in coding and things like that? Because usually, uh, I mean, that's not what is expected or what is, um, I mean, people don't think that <laughs> CEOs will be involved that much. So, so how do you manage to do that? That's something interesting to me. Yeah. So my father's an inspiration for me, you know, he's an architect in the real world. And I always imagine that he, he designs the building on paper, but I know from experience that as the building is being built, he walks around and he wants to feel it and see it and, and be on site. So I, I don't code as much anymore. You know, so I, I obviously I created Tiger Beetle and, and wrote a lot of the code, the consensus and storage engine. And, um, but I like to, I think it's very important to, um, to use the product or to see it, to walk inside the building, walk around it. So we literally walk and talk. You know, we have these design calls and I, I'm, I'm sort of like an architect role and, um, and, 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 and we help each other out. You know, these problems are hard, but together we say, okay, I've got fog of war there, fog of war there. And then we help each other actively think it through uh, and 
we all on the team have understanding like this and we share understanding and uh so I, I try to help from a review you know, point of view and, and know, know what Tiger Beetle is so that I can speak about it uh, with you. So, um, I mean, in a traditional sense, how would you say where you are with Tiger DB right now? So is it a zero to one product or is it at one to 10 or 10 to 100 where it is right now in the uh, execution or in the startup cycle? Do you mean in terms of like being ready to use uh, before? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, so for example, from idea to execution, uh, so where do you think it is? Alpha released, beta released, is the design ready and, uh, you know, code is still being done or, you know, people are using it, things like that. Yes, so um, so we do have people using it. Um, it's not yet production ready officially. Um, we help people to use it behind the scenes with some, extra like safety mechanisms and defense in depth. Um, uh, so we are doing that. Um, so, and we can help with that. Uh, the production release is coming this year. Um, the, in terms of where, where it is, everything I described on the storage fault side, um, we're already testing and it can handle all of that and that works. And we, we do a ton of testing. So I think it's probably one of the safest databases um, that I know of, um, we, we're officially not production ready, um, but the testing is a, a very high standard. There are still known issues um, that we're working on. We have some big protocols coming in um, that we don't yet have um, on, on the operational side. Um, so when those are in, then, then we will do our release. Uh, so we're close, uh, yeah. So I think you have given me the nice segue by the words safe and testing so um, before I have, I have one more question around distributed uh, systems and tiger beetle but I'll keep that uh, for later so the question which I have is uh, there is a lot of buzz and uh, I am also contributing to that buzz that <laughs> we have to do safe programming using rust right Yes. And I know that you had uh, said something that why you did not go with Rust and why you decided to go with Zig because uh, you sort of did not need that fearless concurrency which Rust is actually offering. So I mean, I mean, I might be completely misquoting you here. So feel free to correct me. So the question is, why Zig? Oh, thanks. Uh, I'm so glad. It's so nice. You didn't ask me why not Rust. Usually, that's that's the question that comes. Why not Rust? You know, and now you ask why Zig. So I love to always say things in the positive, and I think the big question is what is safety? And I think I think safety is a very very big field. You know, um, safety has to do with explicit control flow. It has to do with um, handling failures. If the memory allocator fails, how do we handle that? Um, there's a lot of stuff to do with safety with memory, but safety is more than that. It's also about correctness. So most of the bugs we find as you implement distributed consensus are not to do with, we don't do multi-threading, you know, like you said, so we, you, you're quite right. We don't have a fearless, you know, multi-threading need in Tiger Beetle. We didn't want to do multi-threading because we didn't want the, you know, the, the performance cost of context switches and complexity. Um, we wanted a single, th most of the high performance um, exchanges are written using a single core. It's just one core because that is the fastest way to do it. Um, and that, that's sort of the state of the art. Uh, Martin Thompson has a talk on this called the evolution of, of um, the, yeah, the state of the art or the evolution the state of the art of financial exchange architectures. And it, it comes down to one core. Uh, and and you just run that really, really fast because Moore's law is so good. But the, the real challenge is that these exchanges still need a consensus protocol for replication, durability, high availability, strict uh, serializability, just like Tiger Beetle. You know, we've, we've come out of these architectures. And to get these consensus protocols right, um, the borrow checker doesn't help because this is cross-machine traffic. Uh, and we spend 90% of our time on these issues. These are correctness issues. If we get this wrong, it doesn't matter if we write Tiger Beetle in a memory safe language like TypeScript. Um, the, the distributed system is, is going to die really hard. 
and there's no tool you know what what tool helps with that and and there i think it's how easy is the code to read how explicit is the control flow can we handle memory allocation failure um, do we have checked arithmetic enabled um, uh, that, that's sort of from a safety point of view we we do a certain kind of testing as well i think why zig is just our philosophy i came from a c background i was actually doing a lot of security work um, so bug bounties in chrome um, in in other systems, um, I did some security consulting for Microsoft, doing static analysis to detect zero-day exploits, and thinking like a hacker. And the thing that I realized is, I think most of the security people are really concerned these days about the NPM supply chain, you know, supply chain attacks um, in a memory-safe language. So the truth is that. Um, there's just so much more to safety and and that's what you see is that the the thing so basically at the same time i came across nasa's power of 10 rules for safety critical code how does nasa write safe code and and the key is handle memory allocation failure make all your resource usage explicit put limits on everything have no hidden allocations static memory allocation uh and assertions everything must be asserted so you know if someone says to me the code compiles therefore it's correct and safe i would want to ask where are your 3000 assertions i want to see the assertions in the code that makes for safety um and at least you know the, the nasa power of 10 rules for safety could code it's so i've seen it firsthand i've worked on systems that didn't use it um and they didn't work they were not safe you know regardless of the language uh but but that is what we've done for Tiger Beetle. And when we looked around, you know, coming from, from C, I saw that, you know, Zig had bounds checking. It, it, it wasn't Rust with 100% safety, but it had, compared to C, it was already an order of magnitude safer with respect to memory. Um, also with respect to typecasting, um, it was just so much safer than C. It was so much better that that, that kind of memory safety fear that I, I mean C is terrifying for me I, I agree we all feel like that but Zig dealt with that enough for me um, and then all these other things you know what makes for correct distributed systems code Zig was excellent at um, readable code small grammar learn the language in a weekend you can master it in a month these are very important for writing correct code which is which is actually really what it's about um, and then from a performance uh, point of view, uh, again, I think it's very hard to match Zig because it gives you these such a wide array of tools for working with memory. And, and I think this is going to be the interesting thing in the next few years. You know, the gap between processor speeds and memory access latencies is ever increasing. And that means that how you work with memory that's going to determine, you know, is is your system performance critical? Um, you know, pe people will say that language X is the future of distributed systems. And I will want to ask, are they thinking about mission critical distributed systems? Because there it's going to come down to static memory allocation. I want to see that, you know, NASA's power of 10 rules for safety critical code again. Are they doing assertions, static memory allocation, limits on all resources? It's not the language. It, it's... The philosophy, your safety philosophy, and that that's bigger than language. I don't, I don't see any language that that gives you all of these, but you can do it in Rust. You can do it in Zig. You can do it in JavaScript. I've I've done it, you know, and uh, so it, it's. I think it's a, it's a really a philosophy that's bigger than a language. And and again, you know, you know, language X is the future of distributed systems. Well, I will want to ask. Well, do they mean performance critical systems? Because again, for performance. You can't have mem memory fragmentation. You want to have explicit allocators. And just positively speaking, I think Zig is doing really well, you know, with how you work with memory. You can be so precise over your memory layouts, your alignment. Um, so th th I just loved, I, I knew of Rust. I had, I had recommended to other people, you know, like Ryan Dahl with Deno. It was written in Go at the time. And I said, well, do you want another GC? You've got one in JavaScript already. Um, I don't know if he took my advice, but he did rewrite it in, in Rust. <laughs> I, I didn't say rewrite it in Rust, but I, I you know, I pointed, um, you know, to Rust, 
Uh, but I, I just love Zig. It really resonates with our safety philosophy. Um, ac actually, you know that I, I loved Zig's safety and performance. You know, safety critical systems, performance critical. I think Zig is is exciting. As is Rust. Uh, yeah. So I mean, uh, you're absolutely right on those things. One thing I would add, probably from my side, is that Rust uh, Rust has some little bit of. Uh, different way of thinking uh, when about the borrower checker and ownership model right which i don't think zig zig has that kind of difficulty in picking that language up so that's yes. plus one for zig yes i think that's another thing uh, vipul is the developer velocity so yeah. so you can have like if if we can uh, th there's a big problem with c safety we all agree on that um, if we can have a language that is a you know two languages that move in order of magnitude um, in that department. Then after that, we start looking at, you know, the holistic safety and we look at also developer velocity um, and how easy is it to read and master the language? Is, is it a small grammar that we keep in our head? Um, how quickly can we code new things in it? That's, yeah. Hmm. So another question around Zig, how did you convince yourself the investors that I'm going to build something <laughs> which is mission critical in a language which is not that evolved yet. So I'll also have to support the language, uh, maybe contribute to the language and the ecosystem. And I have to hire people. And right now, nobody knows Zig. So how yeah. did that oh, Thanks. Okay. So I, I kind of, I, I always had this personal regret. I'll tell you a story. So 10 years ago, I was, I was convinced that you know, at the time, everybody was using Rails on the server, you know, or PHP or Python. I was convinced then that we were going to all, and it was just a matter of time, and we were going to write JavaScript on the server as well. It made sense because you can share code, client, and server. I was convinced. So, so much so that I learned Java, and I spun up the JVM, and I used Rhino just so that I could write JavaScript on the server. And then Ryan Dahl came along with Node. And I thought, man, this is it. Like, so I jumped, like, literally the day that it launched, I was in Node. And I watched the whole Node community grow, you know, and see amazing people. In the early days, uh, everyone was there, you know, and you saw, you saw when Node modules entered the scene. And, and, I, and I did give some you know, some other feedback on that, that maybe, you know, I, I think Deno now does it right. Um, but you saw all these things happen, and the, the, my one regret is that I never really I, – I was in Node as a programmer, but I never bet the business on it, or I never, I never like, invested, I never really went for it, you know, uh, to, to be a contributor, to actually contribute to Node. I, I used it. And then I kind of swore, you know, in, uh, to myself, you know, that one day when I see the next wave come along, as you see the swell come – I'm going to paddle out and surf that wave uh, because I saw, you know, the surfers that really surfed the node wave were, you know, Guillermo Rauch and um, Ben Nortes and, um, you know, other people. And, and I, I, I was now going to surf this wave if it came, if it came again. And so I kind of missed the rust wave. I, I didn't surf that one, um, but I saw the zig swell come and I was determined not to miss it. So, that was why I got into Zig was just, I, 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 again, I was convinced that this is going to be the a, a future, not the future, but this is going to be a great language for mission critical safety, mission critical performance for systems. Um, because, you know, systems programming is all about working with, with the memory. Um, Zig is great for memory. It's, it's so rich. Um, and so I jumped in and, and uh, kind of invested in it. And I think the question is, are we going to, if you're going to write a whole distributed database, it's a big investment to do that. Are we going to invest in a language of the last 30 years, like C or C++? Or are we going to invest in a language of the next 30 years, Rust or Zig? Um, and I think our investors were wanting a startup that felt like that. You know, if we had invested in the past, I don't know if, they, I don't think they would have invested in us. So actually it made it easier um, that we were, we were really investing in, you know, we were taking a very hard problem, a narrow domain, and then we were going deep, even into the language. Um, but also what I saw with Node in the beginning is if you wanted, you could contribute things and, and have great velocity. And it's the same is true with Zig. We wanted IU ring. 
we did the PR, we got it merged into Zega. Now we're using Zig and I hearing for, for two years and you know, LibUV I've contributed to, and only now, you know, just recently has it landed IOU ring. So we can go much faster because we're, you, you know, we we could add the prefetch um, instruction, you know, to prefetch memory. We put that into Zig as well. It's a great time to use a language now, you know, um, to, to surf the wave. The best time is when there aren't 10,000 surfers on it, but just a few. That you can also hire people, you know, you spot, they're, they're good at spotting the same things. So you, there's a good signal to noise ratio. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just want to elaborate a little bit on uh, the hiring thing. So, I think when you, I, I have heard uh, someone saying maybe it was Elon Musk, I'm not really sure. So, if the problem is really compelling and, uh, you know, the you have to become uh, in, in, in a way that you are exciting for the developers and you don't have to worry about reaching out to quality developers. They reach out to you because you have a well-defined hard problem with good team, which you are trying to solve. So I think that part is sorted out for Tiger Beetle. But what do you look uh, apart from, um, you know, the basic DS data structure algorithm, these kind of things, how do you hire people? What are you hiring for right now? Maybe if somebody wants to reach out to you. Yes. Um, so our team are still quite small. So that's why we, we don't have a careers page up. Uh, um, and we, we are we are quite small and we, we sort of full at the moment. Um, but people do reach out, which is awesome. Uh, and what, what we look for, or, or what, let me rather say, what we have in the team that I really value is um, we have some things that are different. So we don't make decisions on technology because the technology is popular. So again, I think, you know, people will say language X is the future of whatever because it looks like it's becoming popular. And I don't invest on that basis. So we, we invest as a team on is, is the language, what is the quality like? Is there intrinsic value um, yeah. in something? Or view stamp replication, it's not popular like Raft, but it's actually more valuable. It, it has got better algorithms in it. And you, we could see that. So we just went for it. You know? But the, the beauty of this is that you're catching these great waves and you're more visible. So if we had caught the raft wave, it would have been popular, but we would have been a drop in the ocean. No one would see Tiger Beetle. It wouldn't be remarkable. Um, so this, this quality, we call it edge, which is the ability to make decisions that might not be popular. You don't, we don't appeal to popularity, you know, like popular databases do this, therefore we should. Um, or you know, that, that is basically like a logical fallacy, a, appeal to authority. So we don't, we, we tr try to not do that. Um, and rather we try to reason first principles, um, which is to say, what is the problem and how can we solve it as best we know how? And let's put blinkers on and let's just pick the technologies that have quality. Let's put quality in quality, quality, quality. Because sooner or later people notice, you know, if something has got great intrinsic value, if it's big enough, you know, um, noticeable enough, pe people will then start to notice. And I think that happened with Zig. So it was great that we could we could spot it and use it. But we look for programmers that have that quality of edge. Um, just do, do what they love. You know, if they love a language, go for it. Don't worry about how many jobs there are. You might be surprised, you know, you, you pick Zig and the next thing you've got a job because you you picked quality not popularity you know the, the other qualities are energy so just have fun um, and energize others um, and then also execution so um, and I think part of execution is thinking of software as engineering but also as art um, the philosophy again you know um, so um, it, it's it's pretty cool because we have, um, someone on our team is well known in the Rust community, and they, we, for us, it isn't about Zig or Rust. It's about the safety philosophy. We call it Tiger Star. Um, what are the ideas? Um, yeah. So we don't I we don't actually uh, oh, developing thanks. this yeah. system Tiger style. Yes. Yeah. And and part of that is always trying to not do the hundred percent solution so if we if we're implementing an algorithm we actually try not to pick the fastest algorithm the 100 percent algorithm because we want to rather pick the 90 percent algorithm that is simpler and more elegant 
And then we try to do that across everything. So instead of having one component that's 100% and then maybe the others suffer for that because there's more complexity, rather just 90% across the board. And then that, that I think, gets to a, a, a more elegant, simple solution. So I, can't, I guess like software as craft we and, and being prepared to take a week longer and then rather save months of production incidents. Um, just that, that bravery to realize that, you know, a day in design can save weeks in implementation and months in production just to do it right the first time, um, which isn't easy, you know. Um, so these are the yeah. qualities, you know, edge, energy, execution. And how often uh, do you guys fight amongst yourself for design discussions? Hot and never. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, everybody everybody um, is invested in this philosophy. We, this is just what we do. You know? um, so, yeah, it's quite nice, actually. Um, everybody wants to... We, we want to do things as quickly as possible, and we have realized that the way to do things as quickly as possible is to is to do them right the first time because you never know when you'll come back to it. Uh, and, and if you have production incidents again, you know, they just, they can take months to fix. So yeah, we, we, we try because databases are so hard, you've got to do them right. You've got to lay the foundations of the building well, otherwise later it's, it's impossible to fix, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, I have, I mean, just want to highlight, it is fascinating because I have always read and you find a lot of articles around building a culture uh, in, in the organization, right? Uh, if you're a startup, how do you build that? But what I have learned right now that if you have a clear philosophy and if you are building a hardcore software, a tech product with a lot of innovations which you want to do, and if you have rock solid fundamentals and philosophies laid out like you laid out for us right now, I think these things, uh, which which happens later on, design discussion and everything, become quite easy to do because everybody knows that this is what we want to achieve and this is how we want to do it. And uh, the way you said about investing in tech, so even as a programmer, we can choose to invest in some language, some framework, some you know some uh, topic, some subject. Maybe it is AI, maybe it's a distributed system, whatever people want to do. So these were like really key insights for me that you can also build a strong programming culture or developer culture in the start. And once that is laid out, I don't think, uh, I think uh, later on building a design and everything will be quite smooth because everybody knows what they are doing and why Tiger Beetle exists in a way. Yes. Yes. And just to say, you know, if, if you're a programmer starting out, it's not often that you get these technological waves that come along, these swells. So you could pick a, a language like C or C++ that is, you know, thousands of programmers program or Java. I, I would say pick Rust or Zig, pick, pick the one with the, that's earliest with community and, and get in early. Because if you can do that, it's so valuable for your career. You will be so more visible, so much more visible. You'll learn so much. You'll have so much more fun. Um, yeah. So I think I will put that advice as the answer for the next question. That what advice would you give a newbie programmer interested in systems yeah. engineering, for example? Yes. Great. Just yeah, and just just follow your 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 excitement. You know, whatever excites you, go for it. Later on, the dots will connect. And at the same time, everything is hard, you know. So something might excite you for a while, and, and then you might find, well, it gets hard, but then stick with it and be patient and your excitement will come back. So follow your excitement, but balance that out and remember everything is hard. Sometimes you just have to stick it out, <laughs> you know, even if you don't feel like it. Um, and then something else is, you know, just pick a, a domain or two and then just read papers and you don't understand them, but read them again, read them again. And, uh, and then there's the basics, you know, hash tables, cryptographic primitives, erasure coding, data deduplication. Um, and then something that's really helped me is network congestion control algorithms because they actually help you to understand systems as well. Um, if you understand how TCP does congestion control. 
Um, you're going to then apply that to the disk or to memory bandwidth. Um, it's all pretty much the same. The way you work with network is the way you work with disk, is the way you work with memory, is the way you work with CPU, they have bandwidth, they have latency. Uh, but yeah, hash, hash tables be really good at those, like Google Swiss table, the, uh, Facebook Quali F14, cryptographic primitives and protocols, how does TLS work? That will really help you with, with everything. Erasure coding will help you with tail latency tolerance. You'll see um, data deduplication as well. But these are like fundamental. With, with these, you can build all kinds of architectures. So, yeah. Cool. So this brings me to the second part of the, the second word, which you had mentioned in the uh, answer before. So we have talked a lot about safety, zig, etc. The second part I want to ask about correctedness, so correctness of, of a software. Yes. So first of all, is safe equals correct? And how does Tiger Beetle, because databases are usually a, you know, war ready system and Tiger, Debel speci uh, Tiger Beetle especially has to be that because it's dealing with our money. So how yes. do you, how do you solve that problem? Great. Thanks people. So I think safety is bigger than correctness. I think a lot of the problem is we've had too small a view of safety. We haven't even seen that safety must include correctness. So we think of safety only within our language, you know? And I, so I hope that we think that safety is bigger. It's a, it's a correctness philosophy that is bigger than the language. It's something that a language cannot give you. Um, you know, even for example, the, the most expensive security incidents, as far as I understand, were heart bleed and cloud bleed. These were where buffers leaked um, and people could read server memory in HTTP responses. Some of these buffer bleeds, the borrow checker could catch. Some of them are logical errors that the borrow checker cannot see. It's, a, it's buffer underflow. Um, and in the security that work that I did, you know, I, I looked at a lot of this stuff. And so again, you know, safety... Uh, uh, safety is bigger than memory safety. It must include correctness. It's a philosophy, you know, a safety philosophy. Um, and ag again, languages cannot give you that. It, it, you, you can apply this philosophy in Rust or in Zig, but be careful that you get complacent on the language to, to give it for you, to, to give it to you. Um, but safety is also bigger than correctness. So on the one hand, I want to say, yes, safety is bigger than a language, it must include correctness. It's a correctness philosophy. And then again, I want to go further and say, well, safety is even more than correctness. And what do I mean by that? Well, we, we are human, so we never get it right. You know, So we're going to write bugs and we're going to violate correctness. And then the question is, well, is our system safe even if we write bugs? Because no matter how much testing we do, assertions, no matter our language, we, there's going to be logical bugs. Um, how are we going to be safe? Because, you know, if your system is processing thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions a second, if you have a bug like this, what do you do? And there again, I think the safe thing is you shut down as quickly as possible. So what that means is assertion. So if your code runs, it must run correctly and you must have assertions to assert that. And as soon as something isn't right, you shut down. That that is where you know safety is more important um, than availability. Um, the other aspect is that distributed systems are really really hard. The borrow checker won't help you at all with implementing Raft correctly. You know, um, or Paxos or ViewStamp replication. I wish it could, um, but the thing that the, the thing that dominates these, you know, Postgres and MySQL are 30 years old and they're so popular because they took 30 years to test. You know, pe people only, we only found FSync gate five years ago, right? Um, but the, the test time, it's one thing to create a database. Uh, you can create it in a year or two years, but to really test it is the same for a consensus protocol. It takes like, you know, Martin Thompson estimates five or 10 years, you know, for these things to become mature production ready. So, which means for Tiger Beetle, we've got a big problem. Like, how are we going to be production ready? Uh, can we afford to wait 10 years? And the answer is no. Um, the good news is that there's a new way to test these, and it isn't Jepson. Um, so let me explain. So the, the Jepson is fantastic, but Jepson is still slow because 
if you want 40 minutes of test time, you have to run it for 40 minutes. Um, and if you find a bug, then if you run it again, you might not find the bug. So there's two problems. The test literally just takes a long time to run. And if you find a bug, you can't repeat it. You can't reproduce it. And that's what makes distributed systems so hard, even with Jepson. Jepson is going to find bugs, but it's still going to take a lot of time uh, because you can't always find the bug, reproduce it. Like, you know, how, how do you tell your colleague, look, I used Jepson, I found a bug. Okay, now you reproduce it that side. Like, what information do you give them uh, to work together on these problems? So what we, we were lucky here, and we saw, you know, Foundation DB actually solved this problem. So they wrote their whole database deterministically, um, then they run it in a simulator, which can simulate, you know, Jepson tests from the outside in like a black box. They write a simulator that runs all of Foundation DB in, in a magical world. And the simulator can, can control network and storage and everything. It can also see what the processes are doing. So it can check strict serializability uh, in a way that Jepson takes much, does much more work to do. But if you can run your simulator in the your database in the matrix, you know, like Neo or, or Morpheus, you can speed up time in the matrix. You can replay the matrix again and again as many times as you like. Uh, this is basically the kind of testing we do with Tiger Needle. It's called deterministic simulation testing. So we can speed up time because in Tiger Beetle, our timers and everything are our where we get our clock source. Even that abstraction, our simulator can control, um, and we can literally tick the clock second in a while true loop. You know, so three three point three seconds of simulation time is like thirty nine minutes of real world time. So we, you know, three seconds, and you've got forty minutes of test time. Three seconds, forty minutes. But then we have a seed, a little number. We can drop that in a Slack channel. Um, one of you know our team members around the world, they can now reproduce the bug. And someone else can also reproduce it. Now three of us can solve it. And, mm. and, and while we're debugging it, you know, it might be a bug that takes two days of runtime to reproduce. But again, our simulator can speed up time. So those two days are going to be a matter of seconds or minutes. Um, so you just get this kind of developer velocity that you don't get um, before. So, you know, I'm a fan of Fred Brooks, and he had this essay, No Silver Bullet. But I think for distributed systems, this kind of testing is the future of these systems. It, it, it's, it's how we could develop Tiger Beetle to, to such a, a, a you know, very tight tolerance. Um, so we literally inject storage corruption. We do everything that Jepson does plus storage corruption. And we can see Tiger Beetle works. And we've been doing this for, uh, since 2021 now. Um, yeah. So th this is the testing side. You know, this is where... This is also why we wrote our consensus protocol in Storage Engine, because we looked around and everything off the shelf wasn't tested like this. So it didn't give us confidence. Um, you, know, um, you know, the database world are still fixing FSync gate uh, and, and don't really, the, again, these are sort of fundamental problems in the foundations and we, we wanted to solve this right and also test it. Yeah. This is another thing, which is, which answers the question which I had in my mind that how do we, if we make a system which is quite critical, how do we reduce the testing time? So I think, uh, so where can we look this in the code base uh, of Tiger Beetle? Do you remember? Yes, sure. So there's a file called simulator.sig. And if you jump into that file, you're going to see everything, all, all the faults that get tested, probabilities, and how we run everything in process. Um, so I think it's a pretty interesting time. People coming into systems programming, they have just stumbled onto you know what Foundation DB pioneered. This is going to change everything. This is like AI, but for distributed yeah. systems. Like DST is so you know Kubernetes is is gonna it, there's gonna be something much better than Kubernetes. Um, mm. Pick pick any cloud service that the cloud providers are doing. It, it's it's going to be much better stuff coming because we've just got better tools and the, the thing is though to use these tools you have to write your systems in a certain style a deterministic mm -hmm. style that you know kubernetes wasn't written like this um mm -hmm. so I, yeah so i think it's if if i you know was a big provider running on a lot of this old software i would be nervous because 
all these startups are coming and they, they're going to use these new techniques. And I mean, it's, it's there for everybody to use, but it's going to be pretty exciting what, what open source does you know, um, with, with this. Cool. So uh, I'm not sure how I want to conclude as in time. And if we'll have, if you'll have more time then I'll continue with my questions. So uh, sure. I want to ask you this, that, what can we look forward from Tiger Beetle, let's say in 2023? What does the roadmap look like? Oh, thanks, Ripple. So I think we just focused, you know, on our on our first release, and that's gonna, you know, start a cadence of releases. Um, so our first release, we've given it a name, and it's called Correctness. So we're, you know, we're load testing it. Um, we we're basically doing safety testing, performance testing. Uh, I think you'll be excited. We've got a new Rust client in the works. Mm. Um, so if you hop into our Slack, we've got a channel there. Where people are working on the Rust client, a new Elixir client. Um, we've tried to do something with, um, yeah, just also writing about all our database changes, everything. There's a lot going on. So we we try once a month to just take a step back and, and like write a nice like newsletter about all the commits that have gone in. Um, so that's, that's the, um, it's, it's pretty nice. It's just so detailed, you know, all the technical details, what's, what's happening month to month in Tiger Beetle. Um, yeah. Okay. So maybe in the next six months, uh, we can have another, the version two of this, where we take a look where Tiger DB stands now and um, what progress it has made. It'll be fascinating yeah. to do that. Yeah, thanks, Ripple. I would, I would really appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, to a new person who is excited in systems engineering, distributed systems, and stuff like that, how do you uh, think the opportunities in the world exist? What are those um, gaps which uh, you want new people to build startups into and uh, focus and solve hard problems? Sure. So, I think. I think if you look around at, at all the research and all the big, I, I mean, I refer to the cloud because that's where a lot of the distributed, the amazing distributed systems work is happening. It's, I'm, I'm learning from it. Um, the architecture, the systems architecture in the cloud is fantastic. But I think if you look at the actual systems programming, um, there's a lot of opportunity there for, for systems programmers, you know, that are wanting to do things. A lot of the systems programming out in, in, the, in the big systems is like 15 to 20 years old. And what's happened is that hardware has changed a lot. So uh, memory is like the new frontier, how you work with memory. Um, that's kind of the opportunity. Like you, you've got this amazing systems architecture everywhere you look, um, but there's lots of low-hanging fruit in the actual systems programming. Like how, how good are we at erasure coding? You know, are we, are we doing byte for byte um, loops or are we, do we know how to do our SIMD? You know, can we inline our stuff? Um, I think if programmers are good at that, there's a lot of cost efficiency they can unlock. You know, are they using SHA-256? Do they know their cryptographic primitives? Are they using Black 3 or are they using EGIS? Um, you know, Zig has got EGIS already, which is pretty cutting edge. So there's just, you can, um, and I, I want to leave everybody with this quote. It's from Nikita Shamgunov, who's the founder CEO of Neon. They're doing some amazing serverless stuff for Postgres. Um, and he has this tweet. If you go and follow him on Twitter, um, he has a, a tweet that he's pinned. Formula for an infrastructure startup success. Find a 10 times architectural advantage in cost and speed in a large category. It must be a big problem. A lot of people... Um, then build a freakishly good engineering team uh, that use Rust or Zig. Okay, he didn't say that, but build a freakishly good engineering team to implement the architecture in a narrow but deep product and then just relentlessly drive user experience. Uh, so 10x architectural advantage in cost and speed. You know, cost and speed, that's where Rust and Zig and being, knowing how to work with memory, that, that's where pe people can find that. And then a freakishly good engineering team. I think you'll find those. Those are going to be the surfers that are paddling out today for these new systems languages. Awesome. Uh, thanks a lot, Leon, for giving us the time where I could ask a lot of simple as well as little 
complicated questions based on my intellect and i was able to understand the tiger beetles ecosystem a lot better now and hope the same has been the experience of the listeners as well so any parting thoughts before we conclude this oh well, just thanks so much to you vipul for for your um excitement about about rust and zig it was great to see the, the rust meetup that that you at recently and see these languages grow and also in tiger beetle and I really hope yeah six months time to catch up with you again and it's just again a huge honor to be part of the you know the kickoff um um uh, season for your podcast and and all the best wishes for that wow i think it was a fascinating discussion um thank you yoran for your time and the main takeaways from this conversation for me was what is the importance of building a strong culture and how do you do that when you are building a you know deep tech or a hardcore software startup the other thing was how design discussions become relatively easy when you have a solid foundation a solid philosophy related to tech laid out properly another thing which was fascinating was investing in you know new upcoming languages frameworks etc So for example he says that he wanted to ride the wave of node he wanted to ride the wave of rust um and he missed those but he wanted to make sure that he rides the wave of zig so the eye of uh, a programmer to choose that language uh, which you know you can bet your almost a career on because if you get in early in any programming language and you make your name out uh, in in the community which is smaller right now it gives you great benefits in career right and apart from that you know amazing discussions on how um there is a different way to look at distributed systems because network partitions are not only the way uh the major problem in distributed system right there is also disk failures and how do you uh, handle those why will you go with a language like zig and not you know other new systems programming language because of the clarity that i i don't want fearless concurrency because even context switching is um very you know costly so i still have to process a lot i want to go through various papers which uh, he suggested and uh, i make and i hope that you know you were as excited as i am watching this podcast so let me record the another one and i am hope that you are also excited to learn who the next guest is if you are then make sure that you subscribe this channel and comment your favorite take away from this video that's all for this one guys see you in the next one